you, Mr. Bourne, for the opening address. We will now commence the emergency arbitrator segment of the Academy. Ms. K. Shanti Morgan, member of SIC Court of Arbitration and partner of Shen Delamo & Co, is the chair for the emergency arbitrator segment and will be moderating this session. The teaching faculty members for this segment are Mr. Jainio Bandari, partner of Raja and Tan Singapore LLP, Mr. Timothy Cook, partner of Stevenson Harwood Singapore Alliance, Dr. Hopdang, arbitrator of Hopdang's Chambers, Ms. Sapna Jangyani QC, partner of Clyde & Co Classes Singapore, and Ms. Amanda Lees, partner of Simmons & Simmons JWS. In the course of today, we will be examining the emergency arbitrator procedure from the perspective of arbitration practitioners, tribunals, and the SIC Secretariat. The first session on the theory and practice of emergency arbitration will be explored from the arbitration practitioner's perspective. A warm welcome for our, our moderator and panelists, please. Morning. Morning. Thank you. Morning. Morning. Do we take off from here? Is it our? Yes, Shanti, please. Okay, go. thank you. Sorry, Suen. <laughs> thank welcome. you. welcome. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, we can't see you. Hope you can see us. As you can see, we've got an illustrious panelist here. I, I'm not sure whether Suen told you who they are, but in case she didn't, because we've just joined this session, we've got um, next to me, Jainil Bandari. We've got um, Hope Dang, Dr. Hope Dang. Um, we've got Sapna, who sh should be coming in shortly. Uh, Amanda Lees and Tim Cook. If we just give them a moment, they should all be with us. The session today is about theory and practice of emergency arbitration. And uh, what we are doing is we're going to hear from the perspective of counsel as well as the arbitrators um, so that you, you, you get a feel um, for both sides of it. Um, anything with a prefix emergency always sounds ominous. Applying for emergency interim relief before an emergency arbitrator may be viewed to be a path few would dare to tread. But oftentimes it is essential if you want to preserve the subject matter of the arbitration. So what is it? How hard is it to get it? What do counsel need to establish? What are arbitrators looking for? This is what my esteemed panel is going to shed some light on. Um, we thought it would be useful to give you some idea first about, about what are these EA provisions under the SEAC rules. For this, I'll call Jainil to give us your insights. Jainil? Uh, thank you, Shanti, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to start off by just um, um, sharing the screen. Um, if Barry could just help with Rule 30 of the SIAC rules. Um, because uh, the starting point would be Rule 30 of the, the uh, SIAC rules when we are seeking emergency relief. Um, sorry, um, I think Perry, can we please have Rule 30 on the screen? Well, um, maybe I could just outline it briefly. Um, now, what Rule 30 does uh, is it basically uh, provides in Rule 30.2 that a party may seek emergency interim relief prior to the constitution of the tribunal um, if it requires such relief. Um, so as you know, um, you may seek interim, interim relief from the tribunal itself 
or from the court. But in some circumstances, you may want to appoint an emergency arbitrator where the matter is, is very urgent. And that has to be done prior to the constitution of the tribunal. And uh, the, the um, relevant provisions or the procedure for the appointment of the emergency arbitrator is set out in Schedule 1. Um, and Schedule 1 of Paragraph 1 uh, deals with the, the, uh, the application for uh, emergency arbitration and provides that the party that seeks emergency interim relief may concurrent with or following the filing of a notice of arbitration, but prior to the constitution of the tribunal, file an application for emergency arbitration, uh, emergency interim relief with the registrar. Um, again, I would like, I would, I would have liked to have the, the uh, schedule one, a paragraph one flash out for you to see, but for, for some reason, uh, we don't have that. I'm sorry about that. But let me just uh, flag three points for you to note from, from paragraph one. Um, uh, the first is that, oh yes, thank you. Yeah. Now, now, now you can <laughs> see you. that's, that's yes. rule 30. Thank you. Um, uh, can we move to a uh, paragraph uh, one of schedule one, please? Yes, right. So I was mentioning paragraph one. There are three points to note. Uh, the first is that uh, it provides that you must commence the arbitration. In other words, you have to seek emergency relief either when you file a notice of arbitration, which is the commencement of the arbitration, right? Or following the filing of the notice of arbitration. That's the first point. The second point is that the application has to be served on all the other parties. So you cannot proceed on an ex parte basis. You have to serve the application. Uh, and the third point uh, that you should note uh, is that the application itself has to include uh, the nature of the relief, the reasons why the party is entitled to such relief, uh, and you need to confirm that you have served the application. Now, of course, uh, if you look at paragraph two, there is another requirement that is very important and you have to ensure that when you file the application for interim relief, that you make the payment of the non-refundable administration fee and deposit that is required uh, under the SIAC rules, which is stated, uh, you can find that on the SIAC website. The, the deposit, uh, sorry, the fee is non-refundable. So in the event that for any reason, the president of the SIAC does not appoint the, arbitra the emergency arbitrator because he may consider it not an urgent matter, for example, uh, your fee will not be refunded, but the deposit will be. So can we move on to the next uh, paragraph, which is paragraph uh, three. Uh, you will see that uh, the president of the SIAC will appoint the emergency arbitrator uh, within a day. Sometimes it's within a matter of hours. Uh, and paragraph four uh, provides for a default seat as Singapore in the event that the parties have not agreed to the seat of the arbitration. Um, but, uh, this is without prejudice to the rights of the tribunal to subsequently determine the seat uh, after the tribunal has been constituted. Um, in paragraph five, you will see the usual duty of disclosure, which the arbitrator, the emergency arbitrator has, just like any other arbitrator, uh, you know, to uh, disclose any potential conflict of interest. And this is a continuing duty that uh, uh, carries on you know, throughout uh, his appointment as the emergency arbitrator. Um, now, paragraph six is uh, there for a very good reason. It basically uh, disqualifies the emergency arbitrator um, from acting as an arbitrator in the uh, same reference unless the parties otherwise agree. Now, that, that is there for a very good reason because um, the tribunal, once it's constituted, has the power to revoke or vary the order made by the emergency arbitrator. And uh, therefore, it is probably desirable that the emergency arbitrator is not part of this process uh, in order to avoid you know, any uh, suspicion of bias, uh, which is very, very important in an arbitration, right? 
So the emergency arbitrator cannot act in the substantive dispute unless the parties agree. Um, can, we, can we move on to rule uh, paragraph seven, please? Paragraph seven uh, is for the emergency arbitrator to provide a schedule for the procedural hearing or procedural schedule for the hearing of the application uh, where usually very tight uh, timelines uh, will be issued uh, for the filing of, of uh, reply witness statements, uh, you know, or written submissions for the hearing itself and the date will be set uh, for, the, for the hearing. Um, the emergency arbitrator would have to balance the requirement of urgency um, with the rule that uh, the parties must be given a fair opportunity to be heard. So that, that balancing exercise has to be struck uh, by the emergency arbitrator. And uh, if you look at paragraph uh, eight, uh, this is a very interesting uh, paragraph um, because it provides for the power of the emergency arbitrator to order or award any interim relief that he deems necessary, including preliminary orders that may be made pending the hearing. Right, so several points arise here. Now, the first is this, that he may order an award he may make an order or an award, and there is a distinction here between an order and award uh, that may be made by the uh, emergency arbitrator, which will be, be taken up by the panel members later. Um, secondly, um, there is a very wide discretion uh, that is conferred on the emergency arbitrator um, to issue uh, an order and award. Uh, and uh, the question that arises here is that you know, what is the test that would be applied by the emergency arbitrator uh, when issuing the interim relief? Uh, is it the same test as would uh, a court would apply? And again, I think the panel would be looking into this issue or discussing this issue later. Um, the other point to note uh, is that the emergency arbitrator can issue a preliminary order before the hearing itself. That means once the application is made, uh, and if the matter is sufficiently urgent, uh, where it is necessary to have a preliminary order to be made in order to preserve the status quo, pending the hearing of the emergency arbitration itself, uh, emergency arbitration application, application itself, uh, the, the emergency arbitrator can issue a preliminary order and he has the power to then vary or revoke this order once he hears the application, right? So that, that's important. Um, paragraph, um, right, so paragraph nine uh, puts an upper limit of 14 days for the order to be made. Uh, it, the registrar may extend time in exceptional circumstances, but it is usually the case that uh, the order of award is made uh, well within the 14 days, sometimes you know, even within you know, two to three days, uh, depending on, on how, how urgent the matter is. So can we move on to paragraph 10, please? So paragraph 10 provides that the emergency arbitrator will have no power to act after the tribunal is constituted. In other words, he's functus. Um, and uh, the order itself may be modified or vacated by the tribunal. Uh, paragraph, uh, oh, oh yeah, sorry. Paragraph 10 also says that if the tribunal is not constituted within 90 days, uh, uh, then uh, the order may ceases to be binding, right? Paragraph 11 um, states that an interim order may be conditioned on the provision by the party seeking relief of appropriate uh, security. Now, uh, again, uh, at the time when the interim order is made, in some circumstances, some circumstances it may be appropriate uh, for an order for security to be made against the applicant as a condition for granting relief. Uh, we see this quite we see this quite often in in applications for freezing injunctions, for example, or other forms of injunctions where the applicant is required to to provide an undertaking uh, as to damages. Uh, and that undertaking may be sought 
or may be required by the emergency arbitrator. And in some circumstances, fortification of the undertaking uh, may be required uh, by the, the applicant putting up uh, appropriate security um, in case uh, subsequently the injunction is set aside and there is loss or damage suffered by, by, the, by the other party. Um, paragraph uh, 12, if you look at paragraph 12, um, it provides that uh, it is binding on the parties from the time that it is made and the parties irrevocably waive their rights to any form of appeal review or recourse to any state court or other judicial authority in respect of the award, in respect, insofar as such waiver may be validly made. Now, uh, if you look at recourse to the courts, it is usually against an award, at least in Singapore, uh, the recourse to set aside an order uh, is not there. It is an award that can be set aside. Um, and the interim orders that are made by the emergency arbitrator do not uh, come within the provisions of setting aside by a court. So the, the whole uh, idea here is to achieve some kind of finality to the order that is made by the emergency arbitrator, but subject, of course, to the tribunal having the power later to vary or modify the award. And uh, just moving on lastly to uh, um, paragraphs 13 and 14. Uh, if you look at paragraphs 13 and 14, uh, these just basically provide that the emergency arbitrator may apportion the costs uh, and uh, there is flexibility given to the emergency arbitrator to apply the SIAC rules uh, as uh, he or she deems fit, you know, given the urgency of the situation. So I, can, I guess that's just a quick overview of, of the applicable procedure. And uh, there are several points that will be taken up by, by the panel um, for further discussion. So if I could hand it back to Shanti. Thank you, Jainil, for, for that overview, which I think sets the stage for you participants. If you have been listening to Jainil as I have, you will know that the fee is non-refundable, the, the timelines are tight, and we all know in our local jurisdictions, we have courts who do the same relief with the power to compel for contempt. So why and how do you decide, do I go to court or do I um, exercise my right to ask for an emergency arbitrator? Sapna, perhaps you could shed some light on this for our participants. Thank you very much, Shanti. Uh, firstly, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. So in looking at a response to this question, why would a party seek um, emergency arbitrator relief? I'm going to focus on three points. The first is circumstances where you have to seek relief before an emergency arbitrator rather than going to court. The second is to look at the test before an emergency arbitrator compared to the test before courts. And lastly, I'm going to look at enforceability of an emergency arbitrator award as opposed to enforceability of a court award. So dealing with the first, what are the circumstances where you have to apply for relief before an emergency arbitrator rather than going to court? Well, to give you examples from my own practice, um, on more than one occasion in the last few years, I've had to advise clients who are looking for emergency relief prior to proceedings being commenced and stumbling blocks that I have come across in advising my client to go to court have been uh, provisions in the International Arbitration Act in Singapore and also in the Arbitration Act in England. Now look at each of them in turn. If we look at the International Arbitration Act in Singapore, section 12A6 provides that uh, the court may provide relief only if or to the extent that the arbitral tribunal and any arbitral or other institution or person vested by the parties with power in that regard has no power or is unable for the time being to act effectively. Now, 
there's not been much case law on this, but there was a case in 2008 called NCC International Alliance Concrete, which provided that precedence is to be given to the arbitral tribunal to provide interim relief, with the court's power being incidental to that of the tribunal. And this is very much in keeping with the rationale in Singapore and under the model law that the court's power should be very supportive of the arbitral process. And therefore, if you have provisions um, in the relevant rules agreed to by the parties for emergency relief, uh, I think it will be difficult to go to court unless you can prove why there is some reason you could not get the same relief from an uh, emergency arbitrator tribunal, for example, uh, because you're seeking relief against a third party. And we see very much the same situation in England. The Arbitration Act in England provides that the court, again, can provide relief only if or to the extent that the arbitral tribunal has no power or is unable for the time being to act effectively. And we have case law in England. There's a case called Gerald Metals, um, where essentially it was found that where the relevant rules provided for the possibility of emergency arbitration relief, um, that meant that the English courts did not have power in that specific case to grant relief. So there's a couple of obstacles there. There are circumstances where you're going to have to seek emergency arbitrator relief, where you're not going to be able to go to the court that you want to go to um, to seek relief. The second point I'll touch on briefly is that if you go to court to seek relief, there'll be very clear court rules and precedents about what even civil law context, there'll be very clear rules about what the test, applicable test is for the relief that you're seeking. Um, in the emergency arbitrator context, just as generally when seeking interim relief um, in international arbitration, um, certainly when looking under the SIAC rules, there are no uh, prescriptions as to what the applicable test is going to be for the relief that you're seeking. In many cases that can be agreed, but if you're deciding whether to seek emergency arbitrator relief or to go to court, you may want to think about the fact of um, what kind of test am I going to argue that is applicable. In my experience, the test is often agreed, as I've mentioned, but um, many argue that there should be an international arbitration depending on the type of relief you're looking for, a transnational test, which in certain circumstances may be easier to um, easier to prove uh, than the often very, very rigorous tests that you have for interim relief in courts. So one thing that you might want to think about is when you're deciding, advising your clients, should we go for emergency arbitrator relief or go to court, look at the availability of court relief, but also look at what kind of relief am I looking for? What is the test that's going to be applicable or that I'm going to argue should be applicable? The last point I'll touch on is enforceability. Um, it, in many jurisdictions, such as Singapore, emergency arbitrator awards are considered awards for the purposes of enforcement under the New York Convention. Um, and that's the case in several other jurisdictions. Just to give you some examples, there's Hong Kong, um, there's uh, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Bolivia, by contrast, there are several jurisdictions where emergency arbitrate awards cannot be enforced in the same way as an arbitral award, a final arbitral award. And examples of those types of jurisdictions are China, Japan, South Korea, Finland and Sweden. So you need to look at enforceability. Um, it may be the case, I know that other, some other panelists will talk about this, that um, you can hope for voluntary compliance with an emergency arbitrator award. And again, other panelists will talk about that, why there may be a good compliance rate for emergency arbitrator awards, voluntary compliance. But it's always good to think about enforcement um, in our field of practice. And um, you may, when deciding between emergency arbitrator relief and court relief, you may find that depending on where you're looking at enforcement, your emergency arbitrator award actually has a better chance of enforcement um, than a court award. Um, but if you were looking at court ordered interim relief, you would probably be looking at interim relief before the courts where you actually 
actually need the relief, in which case you're likely to have actually a very good um, prospect of enforcement because the court will have jurisdiction over your respondent or the respondent's assets, depending on what type of relief you're looking for. Um, it may make a difference whether your emergency arbitrator is going to issue an order or an award that may have an impact on enforceability and I'll let um, other members of the panel talk about that. Um, but yes, those are my three brief points uh, about things you might want to think about when deciding between um, going for emergency arbitrator relief or court ordered interim relief. Thank you for that, Sapna. That was extremely uh, illuminating and concise. Um, a pitch for Malaysia, uh, EA relief awards are enforceable in Malaysia as well. <laughs> um, uh, another point to, to, to take up uh, is this applicable test that Sapna talked about. Transnational or do you use the court of seat test? Perhaps this is a good time to bring in our three heavyweight arbitrators, Tim, Amanda and Hop, and hear your views. Do you have a thought? as to what test do you apply to satisfy yourself when you're going to consider granting interim relief as arbitrator? Uh, maybe I can um, kick off. Uh, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you, Tim. We missed you earlier. <laughs> I'm glad to have made it at last. Uh, now that my computer <laughs> will allow me to speak to everyone. Um, so in, in relation to the test, uh, as, as Satna mentioned, um, it, it's very common for lawyers, I think, in the jurisdiction where they practiced, especially if they've done litigation, um, to look to their local domestic law to see what the test is for satisfying um, uh, an application for emergency relief. And so in the common law courts, such as Singapore and in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, uh, there's a pretty well established test. And so I think many people often come to a tribunal uh, with that test in mind. But as Satna mentioned earlier, uh, there is, I think, a growing um, uh, willingness for tribunals to consider what is sometimes termed a transnational test. So uh, rather than looking to the very particular test that one might see in the common law or maybe in the civil law as well, then um, there have been some commentators who have tried to put together uh, an overarching um, test that would be, uh, that really covers a lot of the same issues. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, typically, um, is there a need for urgent relief? Um, and um, can it damages compensate a party if that relief is not granted and so on. I mean, that, that, that test we're going to look at a lot more in the course of today. Um, but the transnational test, uh, I think it covers a lot of the, the, the ground that you see in the domestic tests, but it is a little bit different. Um, certainly, if you look at the common law test, uh, it, there is generally a requirement for a cross undertaking damages, for example. Uh, again, in, in the transnational test, that's not a requirement. Um, but it's often something that, that of course, a, um, a respondent will seek. So sometimes it's agreed, as, as Satna said, sometimes the parties don't have a dispute, but some, when it is disputed, so if one side says they want to adopt um, the, a stricter uh, court-like test and the other one wants to adopt a, maybe a slightly more relaxed transnational test, then the practical reality for the arbitrator is you have to then choose um, and decide what the appropriate test would be. And given the 14-day time period, um, to write a reasoned award, usually, and sometimes it might be an order, but typically a request is for an award. And that's an additional issue that has to be um, briefed by the parties, argued, and then ruled upon. So, uh, it, and it can, in many cases, I suspect it leads to the same result, but I, I suspect there are going to be cases where it could depend, uh, the outcome of the application could depend on, on which of those two tests you adopt. Thanks for that, Tim. Um, I thought maybe I'll close off the issue, perhaps Amanda or Hop, our other two arbitrators, on this issue of award versus order. Uh, how, how do you think it affects the enforceability uh, when you issue an order as opposed to an award? Well, I think you need to take it jurisdiction by jurisdiction. You need to look at what the, um, the Act provides in the jurisdiction. Uh, under the New York Convention, given that it's not a final determination, uh, there are question marks as to whether or not it is enforceable as an award under the New York Convention. Certainly the approach that's been taken in Hong Kong and Singapore is that whether it's labelled as an award or an order, it is only enforceable as an order. 
um, it, it's explicit in the Act that it will be enforceable as an order where it's interim relief, not as an award. So I do, um, but so when I sat as an emergency arbitrator, I determined it as, an, as a decision and an order, not as an award. Um, but I think, again, it's something that you need to, to consider and perhaps make submissions as, because perhaps for some jurisdictions, it might be useful for it to be in the form of an award rather than a, an order. Yeah. And I, th I think I've, and the SAC rules gives you the options, the option, whereas some rules, I think it's the ICC rule, it specifies that it will be in the form of an order rather than an award. Um, but yeah, so it's important to think about where it's going to be enforced when making that decision. Thanks for that, Amanda. Can I now go back to our council, Jaino? Um, what about the types of relief sought? Will that impact on whether you go to court or before an emergency arbitrator? Uh, yes, yes, Shanti. Um, now, uh, as I had said earlier, paragraph eight of Schedule One, you know, gives the the emergency arbitrator a very wide discretion to order any interim relief that is deemed necessary in the circumstances. And of course, the overriding uh, consideration would be that of of urgency. You need to establish that uh, that uh, you need uh, the interim relief prior to the constitution of of the tribunal. Um, and and in, in practice, uh, you know, we've seen uh, many different types of instances where um, an, an, an order or an award is sought from an emergency arbitrator. Uh, for example, you know, you, 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 you need an order to prevent a party from disposing of its assets pending the determination of the dispute, uh, which is commonly known as a Mareva freezing injunction. Um, secondly, you know, an order preventing a party from uh, destroying evidence mm. or an Anton Pillar order. Uh, thirdly, an order for an injunction prohibiting a party from, say, disposing of its shares in a company. Um, and then uh, another common example would be where you have performance bonds and uh, letters of credit and you want to injunct uh, someone from calling on the performance bond or from calling under the letter of credit. Right, uh, you may want to seek an urgent order. And then of course we have orders for preservation of property, um, preservation of evidence, uh, orders permitting a party to sell property uh, that is deteriorating, you know, um, um, uh, orders to protect confidentiality uh, obligations. You know. So there, there is really no uh, um, limit as to the type of order that may be granted as far as, as the powers of the emergency arbitrator is, is concerned. Um, now, as for the limitations um, that one may encounter when you seek relief before a, an, arbitra an emergency arbitrator, apart from the issue of enforceability, uh, I would like to highlight two points uh, for consideration. Um, the first is that the emergency arbitrator is unable to grant any relief on an ex parte basis, right? Now, I think, you know, uh, I had mentioned earlier that the emergency arbitrator can make an, a preliminary order. So in other words, if it's very urgent, uh, he can make a preliminary order before the hearing itself. But, you know, that may not be effective in some circumstances where you don't even want to notify the other party that you have filed this application. Uh, for example, where you're concerned that the party may destroy evidence or dissipate assets. So in that situation, uh, you may not even want to give notice to the party. Mm. And if you don't give notice of the application, you can't proceed before the emergency arbitrator at all. Right, so that, that, is, that, that, that is that limitation that you have in the emergency arbitration process, at least in, under the SIAC rules, that you cannot proceed ex parte. So that's, that's the first point, right? Um, the second limitation is where you need to enforce the order against the third party, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there, there is no, uh, you know, an order made by an emergency arbitrator cannot bind third parties to the reference. Uh, unlike an order that is made by, by a national court. 
Um, so, for example, if you want to prevent a bank from paying up under a letter of credit, mm. um, or you know where you have a cargo that is on board a ship that has to be urgently discharged um, or, or sold, right? Uh, and, and the ship owner is not a party to the underlying dispute or the, the, the arbitral reference, um, the party that requires the relief may have no choice but to go to uh, court uh, and obtain the relief rather than, than appoint an emergency arbitrator. And, and again, as, as uh, I think Amanda had mentioned, you know, it depends then on the jurisdiction in which that asset is located or where the relief is sought, whether or not you want to go to the court or risk going to the emergency arbitrator and having, uh, uh, in the case of an ex parte application, perhaps you could take the risk because you could say that, you know, there may be uh, sufficient, there may be insufficient, uh, there may be uh, the, the other side may not be able to, to defeat the purpose of the application. But if it's a third party, you, 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 you may have no choice yeah. but to go to the court. And uh, Section 12A, gives the uh, Singapore court uh, uh, broad powers uh, to grant interim relief in aid of an arbitration. Uh, Sapna had mentioned the NCC case earlier, right? In the NCC case, I think the Singapore court basically said that it was there to support or assist the arbitration process and not to usurp the functions of the, the tribunal. So if you want to go to court, then you must be able to show that the tribunal has no power to, do, to grant the order or to act effectively. And uh, in a situation where you want to bind third parties or where you require to proceed ex parte because you know, it would defeat the purpose of the application, then I think that those requirements would be satisfied and the court would be able to, to assist, assist you. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, so participants, you know, if it's a third party, you need to go ex parte, you may want to consider court. Um, can I call on Dr. Hopp? We haven't heard from you. Um, you are in the midst of EA proceedings. You are the arbitrator. Party then applies concurrently to national court to seek similar or related interim relief. How does that impact on the EA proceedings? Oh. Thank you, Tony. Uh, again, I think, uh, as Amanda was saying, in relation to the interaction between court and uh, tribunal, you need to uh, look at um, the particular jurisdiction involved and to see what the law provides in that jurisdiction. Uh, where I come from in, in Vietnam, for example, um, uh, the, 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 the problem is that the law is still a bit um, hesitant uh, in relation to these uh, relief and some sort of preference is given to the court such that um, if you uh, go into the court and the trial at the same time, then the court may um, uh, step in and have the, the upper hand unless the tribunal has been quick enough uh, to, to make the order before the court does. Mm. And so, so you, you have to sort of um, be very quick if you want the uh, order to be granted by the tribunal, otherwise the, the other party may, may do something in the court system. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that's been in other jurisdiction, you know, th things may be different and perhaps uh, tribunal may be given um, uh, more preference or, or, or support, but clearly it's something that you need to be, uh, to be wary of uh, and study very carefully if that arises. Thank you for that. So participants, you know, perhaps it's time for you to educate the Vietnamese courts by making more uh, interim uh, EA applications so that the courts get used to the idea that there is another competent panel that can give you your relief. Um, okay, can I call on you, Amanda Lees? As arbitrator, you would recognize your powers are not limitless. Have you faced challenges to your jurisdiction? as emergency arbitrator. Perhaps you can share some thoughts on what typical challenges you have seen? Well, I was fortunate. I wasn't, my jurisdiction was not challenged. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, but it, it certainly is possible to challenge the jurisdiction. I just want to pick up, I mean, Janelle's already outlined the, the provisions, um, but it's very important when considering what limitations there are on the powers of the emergency arbitrator to consider the purpose of the emergency arbitrator. So one of the, the big limitations is the emergency arbitrator is obviously not able to determine the substance of the dispute. The purpose and therefore the limitation on their power is that they've been appointed in order to determine the application before them for emergency interim relief. 
That having been said, it does specifically state that they'll have all of the powers um, vested in the tribunal pursuant to these rules as set out in paragraph seven of schedule mm -hmm. one, including the authority to rule on jurisdiction. And there's a couple of circumstances in which that may come up. So a party might argue that they're not actually a party to the arbitration agreement. Mm -hmm. A party may argue um, that the arbitration should not be before the SAC. You know, they, they might, the arbitration clause might be ambiguous as to, to the, the institution. Um, it might be ambiguous as to the seat, though that's specifically carved out, um, I think, deliberately, such as to yeah. say that if the parties haven't agreed on the seat, the seat will be Singapore to get around that issue. Um, there might be issues to do to whether or not preconditions have been satisfied. So obviously in Singapore um, with the, and I can't remember the, the complete name of the case, but the Latanza case, the court made it very clear here that preconditions need to be satisfied before starting an arbitration. And so there may be a number of steps set out in the arbitration agreement um, which need to be fulfilled before a party can start an arbitration so there might be an argument about whether or not those have been satisfied so there's a number of bases you know it's basically if you're going if a party was going to challenge the jurisdiction of the tribunal anyway they are definitely going to challenge the jurisdiction of the emergency arbitrator um, otherwise, there might be a question as to whether or not they waive their right to challenge jurisdiction. So there might be a number of, of um, situations in which you see those challenges. And obviously, given the short time frame, it's quite difficult to determine that. The issue can be opened up again when the main tribunal is appointed and constituted. Uh, other in terms of the types of relief that can be ordered, uh, Janil's already outlined a number, number of those. Um, in the Act here in Singapore, there is very wide power basically to order any remedy or relief that a court can grant. Um, the rules have some specific examples under um, Rule 27 as to the types of um, relief that might be able to be granted under the additional powers of the, the tribunal. But, and rule 30 obviously makes it very wide as to the, the type of relief that can be granted. But again, it has to be interim relief. It cannot be final relief. Um, some examples of relief that have been granted in real cases include orders not to dispose of certain assets, anti-suit injunctions, which are an interesting one, where the tribunal has actually issued an anti-suit injunction prohibiting a party from commencing a court action or another arbitration, so an anti-arbitration injunction. Um, injunctions prohibiting a party from selling shares, uh, prohibiting a party from calling on a bond, ordering ins inspection and preservation of evidence, ordering a party to disclose financial records and statements, um, permitting parties to sell particular cargoes, directing a shipyard to allow the departure of a ship. I mean, there, there, there is an enormous variety that have already been ordered and really it, it all depends on the, the circumstances of, um, of the case. And the last thing I think in terms of powers is obviously to remember that those powers cease when the tribal, tribunal is constituted um, and just mentioning in terms of the power to order security. Now, it's very common in common law jurisdictions for um, the court to require before the granting of any interim relief that the party seeking that relief give an undertaking as to damages. Now, um, the SAC rules do give the tribunal a power to order the party seeking that interim relief 
to to um, make appropriate security to basically meet that that same issue, which is that what if down the track it's decided that the interim relief was inappropriate or shouldn't have been ordered, but the party against it whom it has been ordered has um, suffered because of that. Uh, and the intention is that um, that security should be used to compensate that party. So I don't think it's used perhaps as often as you see in court where the undertaking as to damages is standard. Whereas I don't think that um, parties perhaps have, perhaps the respondents haven't thought enough about requiring that security be obtained. And finally, just to pick up on last one last point, as Janelle mentioned, you can't make an, uh, an order to bind a third party. However, there are many ways of drafting orders such that they achieve the same, um, same outcome. So uh, you might not be able to say, issue an order against a bank that a bank account be frozen, but you could issue an order against the party who owns that bank account to say that they can't make any transfers or withdrawals from the bank account. So basically going to the same effect. Um, so that, again, these are all considerations that you need to think of if you're acting for a party who's um, seeking orders as to, to what are the best, what's the best drafting of the order that you're going to ask the tribunal to make? Thanks for that, Amanda. So participants, creativity sometimes might get you um, to bind a third party. I'd like to cover a few more areas um, quite quickly so that the participants are, are not uh, deprived of your wisdom. So Tim, quite quickly, an application lands on your desk, deadline is tight, how do you balance between meeting that deadline and due process? Yeah, this is a, um, I think it's a real issue. I think that whether you're an arbitrator or you're the council, um, working to a 14 day time limit uh, is, is quite a challenge. It's a little bit different from court because uh, normally at the end of a court application for um, urgent interim relief, the judge can just rule there and then. But, but um, in the case of a, an EA um, award or order, it typically has to be reasoned. So you have to build in uh, some extra time for that. So in terms of how you practically deal with that, uh, certainly from the perspective of an arbitrator, you need um, to get a timetable or a schedule as it's called in, in uh, the rules um, uh, up and running within two days of your appointment. And, and really the best way to do that is to call for a hearing. Um, I typically ask it really within a few hours of appointment as soon as possible so that you can understand um, what is going, first of all, you can decide and rule on what the timetable will be, but importantly, to hear from the respondent as to how much time they're going to need to prepare. Because one of the, uh, I, I think the concerns that a respondent always has when facing one of these applications is uh, uh, getting heard fairly um, in a, a relatively short mm. space of time. So that's one of the, the, the key things as an arbitrator you have to get across. A respondent will always see that, say they need more time, uh, but equally the respondent um, has signed up to uh, the SIC rules with these provisions in there. So they, um, uh, you know, there's limited leeway that I think a tribunal can give, particularly bearing in mind that the first step they will be asked to do is to respond to the application and file any witness evidence. And thereafter, uh, there would be a hearing after which the tribunal then needs to draft the award submit it to the SINC for scrutiny um, before it's published. So uh, there's a lot to do um, in that um, time frame. If you're the arbitrator, you should be really starting to draft the award um, as soon as you get the appointment, in terms of getting all the procedural elements um, drafted, having a look at exactly what the claimant is seeking, thinking about the sorts of relief that's being claimed, and what you as the arbitrator need to decide, which issues are going to be uh, the critical ones that you need to determine. And, typically, and, and, and similarly, if you're counsel, it's the same issue, um, whether you're claimant or respondent, you need to focus first of all on what the test is. We've mentioned this a number of times, but it really is, can be important. If there's going to be a fight over what the applicable test is, uh, then that will need to be thrashed out. And then, of course, then the, um, the substance of that test and whether the um, claimant or respondent is going to prevail. So you need to think in terms of, from a counsel perspective, very clearly uh, what uh, you are going to submit. So you need to be concise, you need to be very clear about um, where you're going and what the key issues are, um, simply to make uh, 
the job for the arbitrator easier and hopefully more compelling um, for your case. Now, um, in terms of how you deal with a respondent, I think, I mean, every case is different. I think you have to hear from respondents to what sort of constraints they may be under uh, in preparing a response to the application. So it may be, for example, that they have a the witness who is going to be able to provide some written evidence. Uh, they may be overseas, for example, and you may take a little bit extra time um, for them to be able to um, uh, present their evidence. Um, so th those are the sorts of um, key things. You, again, it's very hard to sort of legislate um, in advance until you've had that hearing. So I always think a very early hearing is important. That's also the time when if you're going to issue preliminary orders as a, an arbitrator, uh, as a sort of a holding pattern until you decide the main case, that's when um, that, that should take place as well. So that very first hearing, if you as the claimant need to hold a position, normally referred to as the status quo, if you need to hold that position until the tribunal rules, then that's the time you need to make that application so the tribunal can rule either on the spot or very shortly um, thereafter. So yes, it, it's, it's, um, it's very tight timescales. Um, it's, it's a busy 14 days, but is doable. Um, sometimes you can, and I should mention one more thing, which is whether you should proceed on documents only. It's a question that does arise. The rules do provide for the arbitrators to rule uh, based on documents only rather than have a hearing. Uh, there may be circumstances, for example, if the case is relatively straightforward, that that might be appropriate. I think in most cases, I don't know what um, other panellists feel, but in, in my experience, uh, I've, I've not had a case in emergency arbitration, either as counsel or arbitrator, where I've not had a hearing, partly because if I'm acting as counsel, I really do want to give, uh, I want to have an opportunity to try to persuade the tribunal one way or the other. And if I'm the arbitrator, again, given the time constraints, where I have burning questions, I want to be able to ask those of the party straight away and, and really get to the bottom of those so that by the time I've come out at the end of that hearing, I've got a pretty good idea of how I'm going to rule. Thank you. I, that was I, I completely cool. agree. Yeah. Uh, that's been, that's um, my practice as well. I think that it's very important to have a hearing, even if it's only a hearing just on submissions so that you can ask those questions that you have and get, get clarity from them. Given the, the time frame. it's actually much more efficient than having your further exchanges of submissions. Yep, I, I think council also take great pleasure in being able to, to have a physical hearing. Uh, Hope, can I ask you now, uh, money is going to be transferred out on the press of a button. The application for EA has landed on your table. Claimant is wanting preliminary order uh, whilst you're considering the application. What do you do? What considerations do you look at? Um, how do you deal with the status quo situation? Thank you, Shandi. I think um, a lot of the time uh, people see in the rules or even the law uh, a, a very uh, general reference to what's called the test has been you were referring to, and you know, for example, and, you know, in, in the rules in the SIC, you've got the reference to, I think, necessary or necessity, and the same in the Vietnamese law, you have a very general concept of something like appropriateness, which is actually not the test. I mean, that I don't see that as the test because that's just too general. And often, tribunal members, in my experience, will have to lay down some more scientifically um, based sort of tests so you can justify your reason um, and you sort of don't arrive at a decision based on your subjective perception of necessity or, or appropriateness. And uh, there are many, I mean, there are a few things, but the main, the main thing you want to look at is, is you know, as, as Tim and, and I've been saying, Seth been saying that is there a sort of irreparable harm or is there some irreversible consequences that, you know, that, that you'll be faced with uh, if the decision is decided in a particular, particular way. Mm. Uh, but there is one more thing that I'd like to talk about, which is the uh, probability of the success of the underlying claim. Um, if, if, if the actual underlying claim is worthless, uh, to put it crudely, uh, to, uh, it's so, so poor, uh, then you may have a difficult time to ask for urgent relief because there may be fertility in, in ordering the relief if, if the case uh, is actually not a, not, a, uh, not, not a starter. And I usually tell my students the story that I got told in law school that you've got a serious smile test. If you summarize the case to someone and you ask them, are you serious? And they smile, and there's a problem there. So <laughs> somehow, yeah, at, at the very least, you have to pass that, pass that test. And so uh, 
my experience, Carlson coming from countries like, like Vietnam, where this particular aspect is not emphasized, may overlook that aspect when coming to an environment like the SIC and simply focusing on the necessity as such of the belief, but not on the probability of success of the case. That is not to say that you've got to bring in the full case with 10 boxes of documents, but that's not the point. But at the same time, you can't say nothing on it uh, because, you know, man, you might be missing out. So you have to strike a balance in somehow explaining your case in some detail to persuade the tribunal that you do have a case to argue or a, cert a, a, a chance of success. I think it's very important to bear in mind. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for that. Actually, that, that, that gives rise to a bit of a tension. Um, in my experience, uh, young, young counsel tend to argue the case, the merits, in trying to secure interim relief. Um, and um, I understand that's particularly not what the, uh, the emergency arbitrator must do, but then you need context. So how, how, what thoughts would you give to our participants as to how much detail they need in that time that they have to impress you tribunal? What do they need to, to get to? As I was saying, I think you, the, the, the threshold is to convince the tribunal that there is a prospect of success of the case. And that, that, that is enough. You don't have to explain it in full because there's no evidence, there's no, no witness statement yet, but you have to convince the tribunal. This is not just a throwaway line. This is a serious case to argue. And, you know, it will be worth uh, uh, careful consideration. I think you have to overcome the threshold, um, but not go into great detail because the job of the, of the EA is not to determine the merits. So there's no point arguing uh, or, or the legal argument and the substance of the case. But you have to persuade him that as an overall picture, mm -hmm. there is a general dispute and there's a prospect of success of the claimant here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Amanda, you have now decided you're going to grant that interim relief. How do you ensure um, the order or, or the award that you're going to hand down captures the logical reasoning? Do you have some practical tips for our audience if they are going to um, undertake the role as arbitrator? in such a case? Um, well, I think as we've already mentioned, um, it's important to have the test that you're applying set out in your order or award. So that I think is a very important feature. Um, you, hopefully both parties will agree on the test, but I think that should definitely be made explicit as part of the proceedings. So you should get submissions as to what the test is to be. And I know we've made reference to the tests and just um, for the benefit of the audience, um, as there is no test set out in the SAAC rules, um, some people look at what's set out in the Oncetral Model Law, which is in Article 17A, so the, the, the latest version of the Oncetral Model Law, uh, which has a test and includes some of the concepts that's been mentioned in terms of, say, harm not adequately rep reparable by an award of damages, and the fact that there has to be a reasonable possibility that the, the requesting party will succeed on the merits of the claim. Uh, so that's one test that people look at. People also look at tests which have been articulated in various cases, um, probably the, the most common one is the, the UK case of American cyanide that people often refer to. So, um, but it's very important to bring that out, to have that clearly articulated in the proceedings and then set out in the, the order or award what test you're actually applying. Um, I think in other practical tips, uh, you want to include obviously a short procedural history as to what's occurred. Uh, the steps that you've taken so that there uh, can't be arguments as to the procedural fairness. Uh, and then you want to have had the parties clearly um, articulated what the issues are to be determined. And that may come out of this test, but also it might be some other things in terms of particular factual issues that need to be determined. And then I always go through those issues one by one uh, and then obviously have a conclusion as to, to what I'm going to, to order. Uh, there, it may be in that the, one of the, the emergency arbitration which I sat, there was a number of different orders sought. So it may be that you then would have to go through each order in turn and clearly articulate your reasoning in relation to why you're not making that order and why you are 
making that or you are making that order um, in the, the body of the, the um, order or award as well. Thank you, Amanda. Um, we've got a question from the audience, if I could just open it up to, to all of you. Can the EA reject the grant, the relief on the ground that the order or award cannot be enforced in the jurisdiction the applicant intends to seek? Should, be, should this also be a threshold issue in considering the grant? Uh, I can have a first stab at that. Um, so that's what my panelists want to say. Um, I think um, the, the obligation of the tribunal is to render, in a normal case, an enforceable award. Uh, that doesn't mean that the arbitrator, in a normal case, I'm not talking about an emergency arbitration, but, but generally, it doesn't mean that the arbitrator has to go and satisfy him or herself that their award is going to be enforceable in whichever country that uh, the claimant um, might want to enforce in. And I think the same logically has to apply in, in an emergency arbitration context as well. Um, the, it's not really for the emergency arbitrator, I think, to second guess what might be done with an emergency arbitration award. Um, it may be that an award could be conceivably enforced in a number of jurisdictions. And in any event, it's, it, it rather presupposes that there will not be voluntary compliance. Um, and, and voluntary compliance is, you know, is, a, I mean, is expressly stated in the rules that the parties agree to that they will comply with such an award. Uh, so I think it's, in, certainly my view is that that's not the, what the focus of the tribunal should be. They shouldn't be trying to second guess that sort of thing. Thank you. Um, th there should be some basic, do you all agree, um, like you do in court, um, if this order that you're seeking is, is ridiculous, it's not enforceable anywhere because it is non it not sensible, then that would be taken into account in deciding whether to grant it. But you wouldn't look any, in any more detail as to a specific jurisdiction's idiosyncrasies. Would that be fair? Yes, I think that's the, I mean, obviously, you're constrained by given that the seat is Singapore as to the powers you have in Singapore. So you can only award relief that you would be able to obtain from a court here. So if it's uh, completely ridiculous, then and then obviously you wouldn't make it. But you, you, when you're considering it as arbitrator, you're looking at the merits of the order that's sought. Um, you know, there, there are plenty of applications for emergency relief that are refused. And, they, and one of those may be that the, that the order sort is not appropriate. So I think it's very important as counsel to put a lot of thought into how you're going to draft the order that you're seeking. <clears throat> Thank can you. I just add on? Sorry, can I just add on to that? I think that is absolutely right. The um, the relief that you seek um, as counsel, you really have to think very, very hard on that um, because it's you know you're not drafting a statement of claim that's going and whose relief you're going to be examining again in a year's time. Uh, you have to think very carefully what evidence you have available now. What is a realistic order that a, a tribunal may grant you? What I often see, I've seen a number of times where the relief is just too broad. And again, this comes back to wanting to have a hearing because it may well be that as the emergency arbitrator, you are inclined to grant some relief, but maybe not in the manner in which um, it's been pleaded or has been prayed for. And therefore, the hearing is very, very important for you to then thrash that out with the parties and say, well, look, if I'm not with you on the, the way the relief has been broadly crafted, then what about this narrow Ground. And you've got to be quite careful as an arbitrator at how you steer that conversation. Um, but it, it does um, emphasise, I think, really, it's very, very important to get that right. Can, can I just yes. make one small, quick point in relation to, I agree with all that that Amanda and Tim have said, it's just in relation to enforcement in a particular jurisdiction. And the point Tim was making about, um, you know, you, you, you can actually enforce the order in multiple jurisdictions, not just one. So which one are you thinking of? And I recently saw a, a, a scenario where a Vietnamese uh, company was suddenly sent a notice from the Court of England ordering the CEO to be imprisoned immediately for 24 months on the basis that the company or didn't um, uh, satisfy a particular order of a, uh, of a tribunal overseas. 
And so, you know, things like, I mean, I, I forgot whether it was a, a final award or an interim order, but regardless of what it, whatever it was, uh, you know, there are issues that you want to bear in mind, uh, apart from um, the order being maybe unenforceable in a particular jurisdiction. Thank you. Can I just add, um, yeah. I completely agree with everything that's been said already on this issue. Um, and I also completely agree that it's more important for a tribunal to focus on the relief that's being sought rather than where the award may be enforced or the order um, because there could be multiple jurisdictions where it may be enforced and in fact um, even jurisdictions where an emergency arbitrator award is not formally enforceable under the relevant um, arbitration legislation in that country um, in many instances the award may still be indirectly enforced so an example I'm thinking of is India, where um, emergency arbitrator awards are not enforceable through the courts as um, a final award would be, but there have been instances where the courts have taken into account an ar emergency arbitrator award when deciding to order the same interim relief as was the subject of the award. So I don't think enforceability should be um, at the top of the tribunal's mind. Obviously, they should issue um, uh, a decision which is likely to be enforceable in terms of the relief being warranted and being very sensibly drafted um, but it's not for them to um, sort of have to think about it, all the circumstances in which um, the uh, award may be enforced and I also second what um, Timothy said, which is that um, there may be voluntary compliance, not only because it's sanctioned by the SIAC rules, but also because a party who is a um, participant in arbitration proceedings would perhaps be ill-advised um, to completely disregard um, the award of emergency of an emergency arbitrator um, when they're going to go on to participate in the substantive proceedings. Thank you for that. Uh, Jainal, did you want to add anything to that? Um, not really. I think everyone has, has covered uh, most of the points. Uh, um, I was going to mention the, the last point that, that Sapna made about voluntary compliance, right. but she said it already, you know, sure. that I think it's, you know, it would be really, it look really bad on, on the respondent if, you know, it does not comply mm -hmm. with with uh, an order made by the emergency arbitrator when you know you have to go before the tribunal after it's been constituted to to argue the merits of the case or even to apply to vary or, or revoke the order that was made sure. yeah sure thank you for that um, um unless the participants have any questions i, I thought i'd ask a, a question about this uh, tension between Sometimes perhaps the respondent or the parties wanting to lead oral evidence against doing it with documents only. Do you find that it, uh, it, it, it's often a, a difficult challenge to balance? How do you deal with it? Any of the members of the panel? Well, well certainly uh, in the emergency arbitration in which I was appointed, there was F, um, witness statements filed by both sides, uh, very comprehensive witness statements with a lot of exhibits. Um, but the parties agreed, neither party sought to cross-examine each other's mm -hmm. witness. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but there may be circumstances in which one party does want to cross-examine a witness. Um, and so I think you just have to deal with it. And uh, I just want to bring up one issue, which was obviously about hearings. And I think, Shanti, uh, you mentioned that everyone been, likes a physical hearing. Of course, remembering that often in the, the emergency arbitrator context, hearings are held, were held virtually already mm -hmm. and are now obviously primarily being held mm -hmm. virtually. And, um, and that means that you do have scope to have cross-examination mm -hmm. of the witnesses, even if they're not in the, the jurisdiction. Uh, and so it can be arranged. And it may be that there's a very important factual issue sure. that um, one party wants to cross-examine a witness on. So I think it, it all depends upon why they want to cross-examine the witness. And, uh, and you need to be very careful, obviously, about ensuring um, procedural fairness in that regard. 
Yes, thank you. Sorry, I, when I meant physical, I meant oral. No, I'm yes. sorry, I thought you meant. I, I, yeah, <laughs> we want to speak, you know, we don't want to just leave it to the tribunal to read what we've read. Yeah, so yeah. virtual is fine, so long as it's oral. <laughs> yes, good, good, good point. Um, okay, we have a little more time. Any last gems you'd like to uh, pass to our participants, um, each of you, in respect of how they go about their EA applications? Well, if I, I can, I'll just start this off. Um, a number of these points have been covered, but I think if you're acting as counsel, think very practically. Obviously, we've mentioned already about the importance of considering how you're drafting the relief that sort uh, and really putting a lot of thought into that, um, which perhaps is a little different from in your normal statement of claim where uh, the relief is generally quite general, etc. So really think very carefully about the relief. But also think about the time frame. Uh, think about making sure that your submissions are concise, that they cover all of the issues, um, that in terms of any witness evidence, you've got the most important witness evidence in there. Don't you have a witness statement that regurgitates the submissions? That's not helpful to the tribunal. Make sure the witness statement is very much focused on, on evidence that witness could give. Uh, and make sure that... Um, you choose your obviously exhibits again wisely such that you've got everything that's absolutely essential but also don't have a whole lot of extraneous irrelevant material mm -hmm. so I, I think you know given the time frame as mm -hmm. council you need to put a lot of thought into how you actually present your application uh, in a way that is going to be persuasive uh, and equally, if you're the, the responding to the application, how you're going to defend in a way that's going to be persuasive. Um, and so there's a lot of thought required. Thank you. I, sorry, can I? sorry, I was just doing the ladies first, but please, Tim. No, no, no. I, I, I fully applaud <laughs> that approach. So, no, <laughs> I'll just be very brief. I um, uh, completely agree with everything that Amanda said. I mean, just to give you an example, um, this was not in an uh, emergency arbitrator context, but I was once... Um, uh, w responding to an application for security for costs and um, I think half of my opponent's application was focused was it security for costs or you know I think it was a freezing injunction forgive me it's a freezing injunction half of my opponent's um, submissions was focused on there being an arguable case um, and you really you've got limited time for your EA application that is not the criterion to be focusing on the most. Um, you really need to be focusing for, for an application for a freezing injunction, you really need to be focusing on the risk of dissipation of assets. That's the hardest part of the test to satisfy, depending on what test is being applicable. So I guess all I would say is to completely agree with what Amanda said, which is use your time wisely, use your submissions wisely, be bold, be brave, be punchy, and be selective. Use your judgment. Thank you. Tim? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to reiterate this just because it's so important. I think there is a um, tendency, uh, I, I think particularly when you're more junior, to take the view that it's better to include more, ra more rather than less. And it's a very understandable um, uh, route to take, but it's very unhelpful um, when you're trying to determine an application because you, sometimes you just lose the wood for the trees. And there's, an, there's, a, there's a large part of experience that goes into deciding what is really necessary um, to persuade a tribunal to either grant or, or reject an application for relief. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, witness evidence is a good example. Um, as Amanda mentioned, actually very often the witness evidence can be quite short. It doesn't need to refer to legal submissions. It just needs to go to the relevant issues. It can be three or four pages long. I don't know why people are so scared of putting in a four page witness statement. It's absolutely fine as long as it hits the main points. Um, you know, it, it, there's a point about, you know, I think it's quite unusual to have cross-examination of witnesses um, in the EA application because I think, again, the tribunal is not concerned with finding out what the answer to a particular factual issue is. 
Um, I suppose there might be some circumstances when it's appropriate, but I would have thought it's quite rare. But again, that again mitigates against putting in very long witness evidence with reams and reams of exhibits of correspondence going back four years, which no one's going to be able to read, no one's going to form a view on it, and it's not relevant. It's not going to help me get across um, the issue, which is should I grant the injunction or not based on 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 the test that's been provided. So I think um, uh, you know, that try to resist that tendency to put more in than less and think about does this really matter? A lot of this comes down to um, points which are, if I can put it this way, sort of jury points, um, points that have an, an initial attraction for their prejudicial value. Uh, I think arbitrators tend to see through those sorts of points very quickly and they're not really going to persuade you to make an order just because there's a there's an incriminating email that makes a party look bad. If it's not relevant to the application, um, save it up for the main hearing, you have a field day when you cross-examine that witness in a year's time, but it may not be something that is really relevant for the application um, in front of you. So I think that's um, that's really key. Short submissions, short, as Satna said, short pun sheet submissions um, will do, will, will win the day over 100 page submissions. Just because you write more does not mean your case is better, it probably means it's worse. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Hop and Jainil, a minute each from you before we call this um, session to a close. Yeah, I, I think uh, everyone has uh, uh, given very, very useful input, so I don't have much to say, uh, except just from counsel's perspective, I find that being concise and clear is, is very, very important. Uh, and as Timothy mentioned, you know, there's nothing wrong with putting in uh, a four or five page witness statement as long as it clearly deals with the issues that are required for the interim relief don't stray from the issues. And what I find very useful in terms of submissions is to impose a, a limit on yourself on the number of pages that you're going to put in. You know, so if you tell yourself, look, I'm just going to put my points in in 10 pages and, and it's there, that's enough. There's no need for you to put in 40 or 50 pages. Yeah. Thank you. Hop, right. last words? Yeah, thank you. But I think there's one more question on, on, on the chat box. So I'd, I'd address that in my last minute uh, that, that, that is left. And the yes, question thank is, you. Uh, if, if, if a party approaches the court first and the court rejects the relief sought, and when they approach the EA, does the EA reconsider the arguments before the court or does or what happens then? I think it depends on why the court rejected the, uh, the application. If in a system, as Sabno said at the beginning, that if the court supports arbitration and then the court will decline jurisdiction, uh, then there's nothing to consider. Uh, but if the court denied the relief on the basis of the merit of the application, uh, then the question then is, does that court judgment bind the tribunal? Uh, if, if the court is from a different country, for example, and it's got no binding effect on the tribunal in Singapore, then there's nothing to say really. It can be only really persuasive. So if it is binding, it's binding. If it's not binding, then nothing stops Kaohsiung from uh, uh, tendering the, the, the copy of the judgment to the to tribunal and there's nothing that stops the tribunal from taking a look at it uh, and if it's persuaded by the logic and there's nothing wrong, wrong with that but the tribunal may not be. So it, it all, the, 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 the short answer is nothing stops the parties from using uh, that court judgment to spot its case if need be uh, but nothing stops the tribunal from not following the same logic if the case is not binding on the tribunal. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, participants. Uh, last takeaways, obviously, less is more. And don't save the best for the last when you want to get uh, an interim arbitral uh, award. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, Sue Ann, we can call this to a close. Yes. Thank you all for that uh, very engaging session.